Hey, bull drop calculations can sometimes be frustrating and confusing, but they don't have to be. Let's get to it. Hey everyone, Chad here from the Electric Academy, continuing on with my series on code calculations. This week we're going to be doing how to calculate a volt drop, so basically how to figure out how far you can run certain conductors. Next week I'm going to be touching on how to size the conductor using the same tables. And if you want, if you just want to click up ahead there, you can go to last week's and I talked about wire opacity. So this week what we're going to be doing is talking about volt drop using the Canadian Electrical Code. So we'll be jumping around into Section 8 and then Appendix D. For those who are following along with the NEC, the National Electrical Code, I'm going to be using the CEC. So a lot of the principles will be the same, but the rules themselves will be completely different because obviously we use different codes. Uh, what I would love is if somebody could, in the comments below, put which sections the NEC covers the volt drop calculation in. That would be a big help to me because I'm always loving to learn. And I also know that a lot of you are in the States and not in Canada. So this code stuff does not necessarily apply to you. But again, like I said, a lot of the principles are the same. So let's just get right to it here, shall we? So first off, we're going to look at 8102. And so it says, see appendices B and D. We're going to jump into D in a second here. But it says here, 102 says, the voltage drop in an installation shall be based on the connected load of the feeder or branch circuit if known. Otherwise, it should be based on 80% of the rating of the overload or overcurrent device protecting the branch circuit or feeder and not exceed. Now, let's talk about that before I jump into the A and B here. So, several ones basically telling us when we're dealing with volt drop calculations, we're going to be dealing with the current because current and resistance creates volt drop. So, what they're saying is if we know what the load is, say I've got like a hot tub or something that draws 60 amps then I'm going to go ahead and use 60 amps because I know what that load is. I know that that hot tub is drawing 60 amps. But if I only know the size of the overcurrent device, and in this case, let's call it a breaker or a fuse. Let's say if I had a device being fed off a 100 amp fuse, well, then I'm going to use only 80% of that. And I'll go into a, a video on that 80% rule later on. But right now, just take my word for it. Well, it's in the code. Take the code's word for it that you take that at 80%. So a 100 amp circuit breaker or a 100 amp fuse you would size this at 80% of that or 80 amps. Next, we've got items A and B here, and it says that they should not exceed, you, your volt drop can't exceed 3% in a feeder or branch circuit or 5% from the supply side of the consumer service or equivalent to the point of utilization. Got a little drawing drawn up here for you. Now, when they talk about the 3%, what they're talking about is from the breaker all the way over to the point of utilization. So that's where the, the plug would be or your load, basically. I've just got a, a picture of a plug there, but you know what I mean. I could have a load, a disco ball. I don't care what you have, but the load is at the point of utilization. That's 3%, which when I'm teaching my classes, I say about 95% of the time, we're using the 3% rule. What the 5% rule is, is we're not to exceed from the supply side, so where we supply makes their or hydro or whatever the utility makes their connection here to the point of utilization that can't be, exceed 5% from that point to that point. Once in a while that'll come up, but again, for the most part, we're using the 3% rule, which would get us right into here. From this point, which is our breaker, all the way over to our point of utilization, which would be the plug and again, motor, whatever you want it to be. All right, moving on. What I want to do is I want to take you through the steps in how to figure out these volt drop calculations. Now, I said 8102, which is great because that tells us that we're going to be using either the size of the load or 80% of the overcurrent or overload device protecting it. But then it tells us to go to appendices D, and I'll go through those steps with you. So these are the steps that I always take, and I'll put these steps actually down in the description below so you have access to them. But step one is determine if the load is known or if it's fed from a breaker or fuse. So I'm going to go through two examples showing both. So we'll, we'll go with a known load first, and then we'll go with a breaker or overcurrent device after. Step two is determine the one-way distance at 1% 1 and 120 volts. Now that's table D3, which I'll show you what it looks like in a second here. Table D3 gives us a distance for different sizes of loads and different sizes of conductors, but it's only at 1% and only for 120 volts. So we just saw from that code rule, 8102, that we were not to exceed 3% for 120 
for a branch circuit, which is what we're going to be doing, or 5% from the feeders of the supply authority. But we're going to go with the 3%. So we can't exceed that and 120 volts. Well, not everything's 120. So what we do is we divide that voltage by 120. Step three, we're going to multiply to allow for the 3% or 5% volt drop. Step four, we're going to determine the factor for voltage. Now, again, we're going to take the voltage divided by 120. So if it's a 120 volt load, well, then it's 120 divided by 120 is 1. 240 would be going 240 divided by 120 is 2. If you say on and on, if you use 277, it'd be 277 divided by 120, which gives you 2.31, and so on and so on. Hopefully, you're getting the point. Step five is we have to determine the capacity of the wire being used. And there's another table that helps us out with that. So what will be happening here is we'll see that we're putting a certain amount of current on a wire, but that wire is also rated for a certain amount of current. So we're going to determine, are we using the wire to its full capacity? Because if we're not, then we could probably push that wire a little bit further. And then from there, once we determine the capacity, we go to step six. So we determine the distance correction factor, which again is in the, that table D3. And I'll show you as we go. So I just want to take us through a couple examples here. So example one, how far can you run a number four R90 copper conductor to feed a load that draws 50 amps at 240 volts? So if we're going through our steps again, is this a known load or is it off a breaker or a fuse? We know it's a known load, so step one is 50 amps. So what we're gonna do here is 50 amps, this is table D3. So if you go to the appendix D and you find table D3, this is, looks very similar. We're gonna run our fingers down over to 50 and then we're using number four. So we've got the conductor sizes up here. So we're running 50 over to number four, and we see that we're connecting at 12.5. That's 12.5 meters. So we're determining that we can run 50 amps on a number four for 12.5 meters without having a negligible volt drop of more than 1%. This is, remember, this is only at 1% and 120 volts. So we can, we can add some stuff later as we go. So step one is 50 amps. We determine step two is 12.5 meters. Our step three is because that table is based on 1% and not 3%, we can multiply that by three. So we're going to go 12.5 times three is 37.5 meters. Step four is when we start taking into account that voltage. So we've got 37.5 meters. And what we're going to do is multiply that by the voltage factor. So 240 divided by 120 is two. So 37.5 times 2 equals 75 meters. Now we're going to dive into that distance correction factor. Distance correction factor, what we're going to do is we're going to determine what size our cable is good for. So we're using, I'm using table 2 right now off, out of the CEC. So this example said number 4, so we've got number 4 right here, and R90. So we see that R90 number 4 is good up to 95 amps. Okay. So it's good for 95 amps, but we're only putting 50 amps on it. So if I go 50 divided by 95, I end up with 53%. We're only using 53% of the capacity of that wire, which allows us to be able to push a little further than we normally would be able to. How do we determine that? Well, if you turn the page in table D3, you'll see that there's a note, note number three, and that, that gives us this distance correction factor. So what we have here is, the rated conductor insulation temperature, so we've got 90 degrees, and we had 53% back here, but what we're going to do is, there's no 53% column, so the note tells us to go to the next size up. So what we're going to do is go to the 60 degrees. So we're at 90 degrees for the temperature rating of the insulation, then we move along to the 60 degree column, and we get a distance correction factor of 1.04. We can push that wire another 4% is basically what that's telling us. So what we've got here is we can take that 75 meters and multiply it by 1.04 to get 78 meters. And there you go. You can run a number four R90 copper conductor to feed a load that draws 50 amps at 240 for 78 meters. For you Americans out there, you're just going to have to multiply that by 3.281 to get the feet. So you're looking at a few, couple hundred feet there. Okay, that's example one. Example two how far can you run a number six R90 copper conductor to feed a load that is fed from a 60 amp breaker at 277 volts? So again, what we're doing here is 
the load isn't drawing 60 amps, it's being fed from a 60 amp breaker at 277 volts. So step one, we don't know the load, but we do know the breaker. So we take that at 80% because why? The code tells us so. 8-102 tells us that we use 80% of the size of the circuit breaker or the overcurrent device, same idea. So we get 48 amps. So we go down here. Again, we're using this table to 48 amps. There's no 48 amps, but we go to 50, next size up, and then we run across until we get to number six, which in this case is 7.8 meters. So we do that, 7.8 meters. Step three, again, we're using 3% because remember that table that we were looking at, this one right, let me go back here, this one right here is based on 1%. So we can multiply that by three. So we get 23.4 meters. Then from 23.4 meters, we divide, multiply it by the voltage factor. In this case, we have 277 divided by 120, and that gives us 2.3. So 23.4 times 2.3 equals 54 meters. But we're not done yet. We need to check on the distance correction factor. So we've got a cable that is rated for, let's just take a look here. Again, we're in table two because we're using copper and we've got more than one. So number six is good for 75 amps at the 90 degree column. So we're putting 48 amps on a 75 amp rated cable, which means we're using 64% of that cable. Again, we go turn the page to note number three, and we've got this 85 to 90, and we've got 64%. So we're going to the 70% column because there is no 64% column. So we run that across, and we have distance correction factor of one. So it's such so negligible that it makes no difference. It's so close to what its rate it is that it's not gonna, we can't push it a little bit further. So we're just gonna go 54 times one, which is 54 meters. And there you go. That's the two examples I wanted to go through this week. Again, if you want to see how wire opacity is figured out, you can check up above there. There should be a little notification. You can go to last week's video on wire opacity. Next week, what I'm going to do is show you how to use these tables to determine the size of conductor. So if you got a, somebody who comes along and says, hey, I've got this hot tub. It draws 80 amps. I want to put it, you know, 100 feet in the backyard. You need to determine what size cable that's going to be. You can use these same tables to do that. So tables D3 and 8102 are very, very important to us out in the field. Make sure you click on subscribe and click that bell notification. And you can see over there as well, I've got last week's video all queued up for you, ready to click on it. And then I got a recommended video. So just a, a video that I think is useful, not necessarily mine. Go ahead and check that out.